Watchers, welcome to Perth Watch, your horology channel broadcasting from right here in Perth, Western Australia. I happen to be in between a number of watch reviews at the moment, so I thought I'd do a little bit of a talking head video on the top five things that micro brands and some not so micro brands tend to kind of stuff up or not really get right. Before we get into it, I'm just going to do a little bit of a wristwatch check. Not everybody uh, does this and I don't tend to, but I just thought I'd show you guys what I have here today. This is the Crew Automatic Ghost version 3. Pretty special, pretty costly. I haven't reviewed it yet. This is in the testing phase or test drive phase, if you will. So keep an eye out on the review to come out soon. So let's just get into my top five here. So number one, uh, straight up is the naming conventions or the names that they choose for their brands. Uh, previously, one of my cult favorites was Suo. Suo, the Chinese brand. I mean, seriously, uh, I, I think some of these guys really just need to hire a native English speaker to vet their choices, perhaps more than one person, maybe not just one. I mean, seriously, why would you choose the name Suo for your brand? Another one uh, that, you know, actually is quite popular is Quan Qin. Quan Qin is the, is the Chinese pronunciation. It really means crown instruments, which is, is a pretty good meaning, you know, but the name Quan Qin, you know, for a Westerner, how would you say, you know, is it Guan Queen? Is it Guan Queen? Is it Guan Qin? You know, it's, it just doesn't uh, naturally come that pronunciation. So maybe it needed to be tweaked a bit. But some people don't mind that it is actually a Chinese sounding name. And certainly for someone like me, I don't mind it. But I I've heard many people gripe about the name choices. And then of course, more recently, we have Crestical, Crestical Watch. Uh, now, I'm very glad to see that their Kickstarter of their TX1 actually took off. They, they met their funding goals, so good on them for, for making a success out of it. But really, it was a little bit of an elephant in the room when I reviewed that watch. Uh, but having said that, it is actually a fairly decent GMT style watch. I think they might change the name though for their future revisions. Let's see what comes out of there. Okay guys, number two. Number two is pricing. Pricing for some of these micro brands. Now two examples that really stick into my mind here. Number one is Thomas Earnshaw. Thomas Earnshaw, uh, firstly the name is a little bit of a ripoff of the British watchmaker who was very well known in contributing to accurate timekeeping and the early chronometers. Uh, but the, the actual uh, modern brand has nothing to do with it. It's under solar time, I believe. And they've come up with some pieces which are a little bit ludicrous in pricing, to be honest. And I think they, they sent me a watch a while back of a open heart movement. They made a big deal about the open heart and the pricing they asked for was about 1,500, I think, and really, um, I'll be surprised if they sold more than a handful, you know, it really wasn't worth that. Uh, the, the next example was actually the Overdrive watch which I reviewed and that it was really one of my most controversial reviews. I was asked to take that off, uh, but you know, I'll link it up here if you guys want to actually check it out. Now that watch was actually a quartz watch. Yeah, it had some carbon fiber, but was it worth $1,500? I think nobody thought it was worth that. So you kind of need to take the pricing a little bit more seriously, some of these brands, you know. It's a little bit uh, dreamy, shooting for the moon type of thing. I think keeping it real, like uh, some, some more reasonable brands like Spinnaker, uh, you know, Zelos, um, you know, so some of the Singaporean and Hong Kong brands, they, they, they have their feet uh, on the ground a little bit better than some of these dreamy ones. Okay, next, number three, descriptions. Descriptions of their product. Uh, okay, so, uh, the recent example of Crestical, they had automatic on the dial. They might, might, you know, they might correct that. There was actually a kinetic watch, so you know, automatic really implies mechanical self-winding. Uh, Gino is another example. Had the word maritime submersible. It's kind of like, what does that really mean? Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like a, an adjective that doesn't really go anywhere. And then submersible, really? I mean, it's it's an underwater vehicle. Uh, you know, they kind of just throw words in there sometimes that really has nothing to do with the watch. Sometimes you see chronometer, you know, in a Chinese watch. Seriously? You know, you, you, you're not going to get a chronometer outside of Switzerland. That's really uh, where that uh, certification comes from. So what does it really mean? Nobody really knows. 
uh, certified some watches they put the word certified in there sometimes they say officially certified when uh, seriously again there is no such thing that's being done there tourbillon is another popular term that's being used when it's actually just an open heart movement and they know it but they want to put the word tourbillon there in, in case uh, some of you guys you know some some unsuspecting buyers might get fooled into it and that's just not good practice in my opinion uh, and then starking also was you know, famous, somewhat famously uh, notorious for putting the word sapphire in some of their watches when actually it came out with mineral glass. I think they've actually corrected that now, but for a period of time, people caught on and it was not a good look for them. Okay, so those are some of the description problems that I found over time. Number four, implementation of features. So again, going back to the Crystal watch, the bezel choices, you know, they, they offered at least the prototype they sent me. It had a dive watch on the inside that was loosely rotating and it had a GMT bezel on the outside, which was a unidirectional bezel, which doesn't make sense for a GMT bezel. So, you know, they kind of should have just swapped that and keep it that way. Uh, you know, sometimes bezels are not implemented well. Cyclops magnifiers often are kind of just put on as a decorative piece. It doesn't actually magnify it very much and often is also misaligned. So that's another thing that uh, people kind of stuff up when they try to copy Rolex and usually it's a Rolex that is being copied. Uh, micro adjustment uh, and, and I will call out Spinnaker here. Spinnaker in some of their dive style watches they've kind of given a micro adjust on the clasps but they've also tried to put in a dive extension and when they try to do that the micro adjustment doesn't really work very well because you can't actually use all the positions that are in there and that's kind of like a little bit of a cock up I think in terms of implementing that micro adjust function. Uh, ghost dates that's another thing that people don't like, you know, using, for example, the, the famous Seiko NH35A movement, which has a date position, but they implement a watch that has no date, and you're getting a ghost position that has the date adjustment, but actually no date visible. They really should just stick with a no date movement if they're going to do that. A lot of people would find that much more preferable. And then lastly, I'll, I'll bring out fake screw pushes in chronographs and I will call out Omega on this one. So that Seamaster chronograph, uh, I reviewed this a long while back. Uh, now, beautiful watch, but you know, they had this kind of push crown uh, look to the chronograph pushes when it actually didn't function. It was just decorative and I think they kind of took inspiration, for example, the Rolex Daytona, which actually has real screw pushes. You know, uh, that's, that was a little bit of a poor move by Omega. I think why do fake screw pushes just to have the look better just to you know not fake it and give us something different okay last one guys last one in my top five are proportions and proportions a little bit subjective but sometimes i think they really get it wrong so the example that comes most foremost to my mind is actually the most successful spinnaker video that i have ever made and i titled it worst watch ever because I really didn't like it. It was really an ugly look and I thought the indices were far too big. But you know, some people actually don't mind it and that video ended up having the most views out of any Spinnaker video. Other proportional mistakes or missteps that come to mind uh, include bezels that might be sometimes too thick or too prominent and hands as well that are sometimes either mismatched or too large or sometimes too small. So guys, there you go. That's my top five lists of things that micro brands and not so micro brands tend to stuff up. Let me know your thoughts. What are the things that you have seen that you know brands sometimes get wrong or really stuff up in a big way? Would love to hear your thoughts. I'm sure there, you know, there, there are a lot of things that you would have seen in your time if you're interested in the world of horology. I would like to hear your observations of what you have seen. So guys, if you enjoy my videos, do consider subscribing. I put out new content every week, always aiming to be objective and unbiased about all things horology. Thank you again for sticking with me. And as always, I'll catch you guys again next time.